Welcome back to this introductory statistics course. Today we're talking about ANCOVA, which is short for Analysis of Covariance. This is nothing new. We're just looking at some of the material we've covered in previous weeks from a different perspective. Because Analysis of Covariance combines several of the ideas we've covered in previous weeks. It relates to multiple regression, it relates to using dummy variables to conduct an ANOVA analysis, and it relates to a previous lecture on causality. So let's put those ideas together to understand ANCOVA. We can define analysis of covariance as multiple regression with one categorical variable of interest and at least one continuous control variable that's not directly of interest. So what are covariates or control variables? Well, covariates are variables that are related to the dependent variable, but they are not of primary interest to the researcher. Very often, people consider age, sex, education level, and similar variables to be control variables, but not of primary theoretical interest. In order to make the distinction between a control variable and a predictor that is of theoretical interest, it is unavoidable to discuss causality. And if you think back to the lecture in which I gave a short primer on causality, you may remember that it's really useful to control for confounders, but you should never control for colliders. So when we determine which variables should be included as controls, it's really important to get this distinction right. So we can control for confounders, and those are predictors that are causes of either another predictor or the outcome of interest but we should never control for colliders, and those are variables that are caused both by one of the predictors and the outcome of interest. If you do control for a collider, the rest of your results will become uninterpretable. And this is a very strong argument for why you shouldn't control for everything but the kitchen sink. Instead, you should think really thoroughly about which variables to include as controls, and if you want to delve deeper into why this is, I recommend reading The Book of Why by Judea Pearl. But if control variables are so finicky, why should we control for them at all? Well, controlling for covariates can reduce the residual variance in your outcome, which increases your power to find an effect for the predictor of interest. Covariates are also essential if you want to perform causal inference. For example, when you use naturally observed data resulting from a quasi-experiment. So for example, people were not randomly assigned to groups, but they self-selected into groups. In such situations, it is possible to select covariates that will allow you to draw causal conclusions about the effect of the intervention, but only through very careful selection of covariates. Within the scope of this course, unfortunately, we can't go much more in depth about this topic, but here is a reference that will help you select good and bad controls in your multiple regressions. So very briefly, let's discuss what is a good control variable. Assume that variable A is a factor, so it's a categorical predictor, and it represents an intervention that has occurred through a natural experiment. For example, people self-selected into two groups. There's no random assignment, people just volunteered to receive one of both treatments. Variable B is the outcome, and in this case it is a continuous variable. And then factor C is a third variable. So one example of a good control where we should control for variable C is the following. When A causes B, but C additionally causes both A and B. So let's make this a little bit more tangible. Imagine that variable A is whether or not people took a homeopathic supplement. So it's a natural experiment. Some people volunteered to take the supplement and other people did not. Variable B is perceived health improvement, self-reported improvement in health. And then variable C is the belief in the efficacy of the supplement. So because belief in the efficacy of the supplement is likely to both cause self-selection into the group that took the supplement and improved feelings of well-being, variable C will cause a spurious relationship between A and B. So if you want to know if there's a causal effect of A on B, you must control for the confounder C 
because otherwise there will appear to be an effect that's not actually caused by A, but is caused in the belief about the efficacy of A. So in this case, C would be a good control. In some cases, it's neither good nor bad to control for C. And we can call such a situation a covariate. So in the diagram below here, C is not related to A, but it is a predictor of B. So controlling for C in this context will reduce the error variance of B, which increases our power to detect an effect of A, but does nothing else. So in this case, it's beneficial for power. It makes no difference from a causal inference point of view if you control for C. Why is the experimental method so great at detecting causal effects? Well, it's great because it breaks any connections between confounders and the treatment A. So remember in a previous example, C was belief in the efficacy of a homeopathic supplement and A was whether or not people took the supplement. In a natural experiment, belief in the efficacy of a supplement of course is going to increase the likelihood that people will take that supplement. So there will be a connection between C and A. But if we randomly assign people to either receive the supplement or not, that connection between C and A will be broken. So in other words, we break any arrows going into the intervention variable that we experimentally manipulated, thereby eliminating a whole slew of confounders. Here's another experiment of a neutral control when the third variable C is a cause of the intervention variable A. So if this happens in a natural experiment, controlling for C will reduce the variance in A, which may reduce the precision of the effect of A on B. And in a randomized controlled experiment, any causal effect of C on A will be prevented by random assignment. So if you still see a residual effect of C on A, that's due to pure chance, and controlling for such causes of A when you're doing an experiment will introduce bias. So if C is only a cause of A, it's not terrible to control for it in a natural experiment, but in a true randomized controlled experiment, you should not control for it. And finally, we get to the bad controls, and the quintessential example of a bad control is the collider variable, a variable that is caused both by the intervention A and the outcome B. If you control for C when it's caused by both A and B, then you will create a biased relationship between A and B. So let's look at this in the context of an applied example. Imagine that variable A is smoking and there's a natural experiment going on because some people choose to smoke and other people do not. And then variable B is infant mortality. Let's say that C is infant low birth weight. So in this case, if you control for low birth weight, there will appear to be a negative relationship between smoking and infant mortality. And it will not surprise you to hear that for decades, the tobacco industry used this as an argument to claim that smoking protected against infant mortality, when of course, nothing could be further from the truth. Another example of a bad control is if you control for an outcome of the outcome B. So in this case, the variable C is not a true collider because it's not caused by A, but it is caused by B, and it doesn't make sense to control B for the effect of C. And another example of a bad control is what is called over-control bias. So in this case, imagine that the variable C is a mediator of the effect of A on B. So mediator means that it is a process variable that explains why A has an effect on B. In this case, if you control the effect of A on B for the variable C, then much of the effect of A will be explained away by its mediator C. So you might underestimate the effect of A on B. In some cases, this is exactly what you want. When you want to show that there is mediation, you might demonstrate that the effect of A and B is largely ex explained away when you account for C. But if you're just looking for the effect of A on B, then controlling for a mediator will lead you to underestimate it. So to sum this up, Controlling for covariates is sometimes good, sometimes neutral, and sometimes bad. Which of these is the case depends on your causal model. So it is advisable anytime you're doing multiple regression to think through your causal assumptions and maybe draw them out on a piece of paper.
So now let's dig into some analyses. First, we'll consider some example data. Imagine that I conduct a natural experiment at the train station. I have participants choose a drink out of a cooler. There are two different drinks, namely Red Bull and Herbal Tea. And to account for the difference between these two drinks, I have a factor variable with two levels, a binary factor, that represents either Red Bull or Herbal Tea. After having the drink, my participants perform a memory task. And the dependent variable is how many words they were able to remember in this task. And I'm going to control for a covariate, which is participant's age. So what kind of control variable is participant's age? Well, I think it is a neutral control like this, where participant's age does have a causal effect on the number of words remembered, but it probably doesn't have a causal effect on the drink they took. Well, actually, maybe younger people might prefer Red Bull. So it might also have a causal effect on the drink they took, in which case it would go from a neutral control to a good control. So controlling for age here is either neutral or good. So let's have a look at the results of a regression analysis accounting only for the choice of drink. So what we see here is an intercept of 22.8, which means that on average, people who drank herbal tea remembered 22.8 words. And then we see an effect of the dummy drink Red Bull, and its effect is minus 10.7. So does that mean that drinking Red Bull harms your memory? Does it mean a 10.7 word reduction on average in the number of words remembered? Maybe not. We could come up with a plausible story as to why this might be the case. For example, we might just take these results at face value and conclude that Red Bull makes people distractible and therefore they remember fewer words. But if we include age as a control variable, our results change. So here is the effect of age. We see that there is a negative effect of age. That is significant. And we still see that there is a negative effect of Red Bull, but now it is no longer significant. So we cannot conclude that the effect of drinking Red Bull on memory is significantly different from zero. In other words, if we account for age, we no longer see an effect of the type of drink on memory performance. So in this case, we can conclude that age is a confounder, old people's memory is slightly worse than young people's memory, and they tend to prefer drinking tea over drinking Red Bull. So you see that accounting for a control variable can make all the difference. But the results might also have looked like this. Consider the same example, but the causal structure is slightly different. If we just look for the effect of drinking Red Bull versus drinking herbal tea, we observe no significant effect. There's no difference in the mean number of words remembered between the groups that had the two different types of drinks. So we could conclude that there's no effect of drinking Red Bull on memory. But if we conduct an ANCOVA controlling for age, what we might see is that age does have a significant effect, but there's still no effect of drinking Red Bull on memory. And in this case, age is a neutral control. It didn't cause differences in whether or not people liked drinking Red Bull, but it did have a significant effect on the number of words remembered. So it's not always that you'll get the same pattern of results. One term you will often see in the context of ANCOVA analyses are adjusted means. And adjusted means tell you what would the mean of these groups have been had they scored the same on the covariate. So one way to think about controlling for a covariate is that you are accounting for differences between the groups. So recall that when we conduct multiple regression, we obtain the effect of each predictor, accounting for the effect of all other predictors. And we can use that property to reconstruct the adjusted means. In other words, what would the means have been had people scored differently on the control variable. We can illustrate what the adjusted means are using these diagrams. So imagine that this orange ellipses here represents the data originating from your control group and the gray ellipsis here represents the data that originated from your experimental group. So imagine that the orange ellipsis here originated from the Red Bull group and the gray ellipsis here originated from the herbal tea group. Within both of those groups, there is an effect of age. 
which in this case would be the covariate x. Nevertheless, each group has a mean value on the outcome, which is number of words remembered. So for the orange ellipsis, this point in the middle represents the mean value on words remembered for that group. And we can project that onto the y-axis. It would be right here. And the same thing for the gray group. This gray dot represents the mean value of the gray group. And we could also project that onto the y-axis. And then we see that before controlling for the covariate, there's a pretty big mean difference between the mean of the orange group and the mean of the gray group. But the groups also differ on their values on the covariate x. Specifically, we see that all people in the orange group scored lower on the covariate x, and all people in the gray group scored higher on the covariate x. If we want to make these groups comparable on the covariate x, we would have to look what their means would be had they both scored the same on the covariate. And to do that, we can estimate the linear regression effect of the covariate and extrapolate that to a particular value, for example, the value zero for the covariate x. And then we would get an adjusted mean for the orange group over here. So we basically look where the regression line of the covariate intersects a particular value for that covariate. And we can do the same thing for the gray group. We can estimate the regression line for the effect of the covariate there and extrapolate it until we get to the same value for the covariate. And then we see that after adjusting for the pre-existing group differences on the covariate, the mean differences between the orange and the gray group are much smaller. Moreover, they are reversed compared to what they were before adjusting for the covariate because then the gray group scored higher than the orange group, but after adjusting, we see that the orange group scores higher than the gray group. And that shows why it can be very important to adjust for covariates. But the mean difference can also increase. So in this picture on the right, what we see is that still the orange group scores much lower on the covariate than the gray group, but both groups score approximately equal on average on the dependent variable y. So there's a very small mean difference between them before adjusting for the covariate. But if we adjust for the covariate, we extrapolate along the regression line until we reach the same value on the covariate, which is here indicated by the green dotted line. So this dot here would be the adjusted mean for the orange group. And we can do the same thing for the gray group. We can extrapolate along the regression line for the effect of x until we intersect the green dotted line. And then this is the adjusted mean for the gray group. And we see now that the difference between the adjusted means is much larger than the difference between the unadjusted means. So after adjusting, the effect can go either way, it can either be much bigger or much smaller. So how do we obtain such adjusted means? Well, one way is using the regression coefficients. The regression coefficients give us the mean value of the reference group for a covariate value of zero. And the slope of the dummy variables allows us to calculate the mean for the other groups also for a covariate value of zero. And we can then use the regression formula to calculate adjusted means for other covariate values. So how does this work? Well, let's go back to our Red Bull example. And here we have a coefficients table for the ANCOVA, which includes the effect of drinking Red Bull. So our intercept here represents mean recall in the group that drank herbal tea. And the effect of drink Red Bull shows us the effect of the dummy variable. In other words, this minus 3.09 represents the mean difference in unadjusted means between herbal tea drinkers and Red Bull drinkers. And then there's an effect of the covariate age. So we can write down this formula and calculate the adjusted means for 20 year old participants. So for 20 year old tea drinkers, we calculate the intercept, because that's the mean value for tea drinkers, plus 20 years times the effect of age. So 20 times minus 0.26 equals 25. So for 20-year-old tea drinkers, the adjusted mean is 25 words remembered. 
Now, for 20-year-old Red Bull drinkers, first we calculate their value as the intercept plus the difference between Red Bull drinkers and herbal tea drinkers, that's minus 3.09, plus 20 times minus 0.26 to account for the effect of age, and we obtain an adjusted mean of 21.9. So the adjusted mean of remembered words for 20-year-old Red Bull drinkers is 21.9 words remembered. There is also a second way to calculate the adjusted means, and that is using the group means. So in order to calculate the adjusted group means, Y bar, which stands for the mean of Y, for group G, adjusted, we take Y bar of group G, so the unadjusted mean of group G, minus the regression slope B, times the difference between the group mean on the control variable, minus the overall group mean on the control variable. So this formula between parentheses here tells us how many points does the average value of predictor X in group G differ from the overall mean of predictor X. And we multiply that by the effect of predictor X and subtract that from the unadjusted mean of the outcome in group G. I personally prefer just using the regression formula because you can use the regression formula for lots of other things as well. So you don't have to learn yet another technique, but I do want to show you this formula for adjusted group means so you could use it in a pinch if necessary. And this is all you need to know in order to be able to work with ANCOVA analyses. So you see, it's a lot of refreshing of previously covered material. So get some practice with the tutorial assignments and I'll see you next week.